2020 has been a bizarre year. On one side, we've got the horrors of COVID-19 and the U... Uh, the majority of the world's terrible reaction to it. New Zealand is the only country that gets a gold star in terms of pandemic response. Well done, New Zealand! Yet, despite the pandemic at all, we've seen a massive growth in interest in electric vehicles, as well as a massive rise in the number of companies coming into the spotlight that are interested in following Tesla and becoming profitable in the world of either clean energy or transportation. To be fair, though, it didn't start overnight. It's been going on for the last four or five years. Companies have come into the spotlight promising us revolutionary vehicles or incredible energy products and nearly always offer us products that never come to market when they say they actually will. Or more commonly, they make a lot of promises about a new product that never makes it to production. In the last couple of weeks, we've covered a couple of electric car startups offering or promising new vehicles, and usually the comments section has been full of generally negative comments, grouping many startups in with one another and stating that none of them will, quote, ever make it to market. At the risk of sounding crass, some of you are stuck with the mantra that if it isn't Tesla, then it won't succeed. But while that opinion is kind of popular right now, especially in the age of Gravity Gate, I'm about to explore why not all green car and energy startups are created equally. And it's got a lot to do with the way they're funded, their company structure, their promises, and their plans for execution. So today I'm going to look at some VC 101 as well as combine that with some automotive development and press 101. I'm also going to tell you some telltale signs to look for that will give you more idea as to if a company is overhyping itself. Because essentially figuring out how a company is performing is not just about its investors or its technology. It's about a combination of them, as well as how they handle genuine media questions and criticisms, and how their leader performs. Hopefully at the end of this, you'll see that Lucid is not like Lordstown, that Fisker is not Archimoto, and I hope that you'll have more tools to correctly assess each company and their merits moving forwards. Little disclaimer, I'm not a financial expert, so if I get something wrong, please let me know. First, Let's examine the painful reality for any startup, regardless of the sector. The journey from initial founding to eventual success is a difficult one that most companies never actually complete. If you imagine the startup world as a funnel for every 100 companies that enter at the top, fresh-faced and ready to do battle with the world, less than 10 will come out at the other end as a sustainable business. And even then, that company may not actually be able to sustain itself indefinitely and grow. Its balance sheet may look good for a few years, but if it's unable to grow and adapt to the market, well, it's usually game over. And of those 10 that come out as a reasonably successful business, only one will achieve true unicorn status, a term that means a privately owned company has reached a genuine valuation of at least $1 billion, by which point investors are falling over themselves to provide additional funding, either through ongoing series funding rounds, a traditional initial public offering, IPO, or a merger. That funnel methodology can be tracked at a more granular scale too. When you start a company, it needs an initial injection of cash. That usually takes the form of a company founder injecting some of their own capital into the business, combined with what's known as an angel investor round or a seed round, where investors put down money to help the company get its metaphorical feet off the ground. In an ideal world, the company then uses that capital investment to help it grow and get ready for its A series investment round, which then helps it get to the B series investment round, etc, etc. At each round, the company attracts ever larger sums of money, usually from ever increasingly influential companies, be it individual investors, another company in the sector, or large institutional investors like banks, retirement funds, and sovereign wealth funds. At every hurdle, every funding round, there's a chance the company will not progress, and thus more and more companies are weeded out. It's only those that have successfully got through multiple rounds of funding in addition to their angel investment or their seed round, which really stand a chance of moving onwards. But even then, well, it's no foregone conclusion, and only a handful of companies get to a point where they're ready to enter into an IPO or a reverse merger or an acquisition, or for that matter, volume production. 
Traditionally, the more funding rounds a company has, the more likely it is to continue to do well and in the automotive sector, bring a vehicle to market. Then for investors who missed out on getting in early with Tesla, these new startups are an irresistible buy. That said, not every company that successfully completes lots of funding rounds makes it to profitability. You only have to look at Byton, which raised over just $1.2 billion over four rounds of funding, to see that things don't always go as planned. Byton was essentially hemorrhaging cash and is now, to all intents and purposes, on death watch, despite having a functional prototype vehicle that our very own Kate Walton Elliott was able to drive this year at CES. In the year of special purpose acquisition companies, that's SPACs or SPACs, depending on how you want to say it, many companies are jumping well past the usual VC round method and going straight to reverse mergers and the stock market, which of course means more risk for investors, and I'd suggest, in my humble opinion, some more uncertainty about if that vehicle is actually going to come to market or not, or if it's just going to burn a lot of cash. In jumping from their initial rounds to the stock market, these young companies are, I'd suggest, eager to exploit the bubble, to make money and bring vehicles to market, but they don't have years of hard slog to back them up. Nevertheless, money is available and is being thrown at the sector, and so they're eager to take advantage of it. Lordstown has, according to Crunchbase, only had one funding round so far, a seed round of just $5 million last November, yet it is preparing for a reverse merger with a SPAC that will see it enter onto the stock market. I've spent some time going over its SEC filings for its reverse merger, and I can't see much in the way of financial information to go on based on its previous investment, only that it had a $7 million loss last year. Canoe is in a similar position. It's recently entered the market with a reverse merger, but ahead of that, well, its funding is unclear. It used to be known as eVelocity and was funded in 2018 by three former BMW executives, all of which had previously left Faraday Future and so were subject to a lawsuit from Faraday Future for allegedly stealing confidential information and poaching employees. Nevertheless, they claimed in 2018 to have raised $1 billion in capital, but I've been unable to find out where that actually came from. And in the official investment presentation prepared as part of Canoe's reverse merger, it said that it had raised $250 million to get it to its beta stage and, quote, over $450 million capital raised to date, prior, by the way, to the completion of the reverse merger. Both of these two firms appear to be in their early stages of alpha or beta prototype production. Going through a reverse acquisition, reverse merger, helps fund further development, but it's important to note that these companies aren't yet anywhere near series production. Lordstown's Investor Prospectus, for example, states that it needs $120 million of investment to retool its production facility in Lordstown, Ohio, to actually begin production. It also comically uses Fisker and Nicola as comparables to help figure out its business value, which does make me chuckle a bit. Canoe, meanwhile, has at least shown off its prototypes more than Lordstown. It's let Jay Leno drive a prototype, and it's actually let people see the vehicle up close and personal. And that is a positive sign for the company, which has also shared some developmental videos that are more than a few seconds long. But that said, it's still very much a long way from production. Fisker, Faraday Future, and of course Nikola have all looked at or executed a reverse merger, all for the exact same reason, access to funding. In the case of Fisker and Nikola, there were significant funding rounds prior to their reverse merger. And with Faraday Future, well, that's complicated because of the company's history. It had four rounds of funding, based on what I can tell, but while I understand some of that investment was complicated and much of the funding has come from the form of debt financing rather than investor equity financing. The latter involves giving up some of the company's ownership in exchange for money, which is more traditional than debt financing, where the company in question borrows money from an investor and then pays it back with interest at some point in the future. Before we go into the automotive prowess, 
let's throw in a nod to companies that aren't going down the traditional route towards market production. Lightyear and Atlas have both shunned more traditional routes to market and have instead looked towards crowdfunding from regular members of the public. This is usually done because a company doesn't want to be trapped in the usual cycle of traditional startup land, at least not at that point. And sometimes it can work in the company's favour. Take Akimoto, for example. It had a crowdfunding round as well as traditional VC funding. And now it's a publicly traded company, having gone through its own, honest to goodness, traditional IPO. Sure, it's a niche market vehicle manufacturer and right now is still trying to figure out how to become profitable, something Sandy Monroe is helping it with. But it's also done what it's done with a lot less bluster and hyperbole than most of the companies on this list, as well as companies that have crashed and burned in the past. It, for the most part, has knuckled down and got on with making a vehicle, and it has my respect for that. But then again, I am partial to small, not cars, so... Uh, then there are other companies like Nio, which is pretty much ignored in the US, but is an established brand in China. It's not technically a startup because of this, so I'm not going to mention it in this piece, other than to say it and those like it are in a special kind of segment where some of the judgments I'm using today don't really work. As I said at the top of this piece, funding isn't the only thing that you need to look at. While looking at a company's A, B and C or higher funding rounds help you to figure out how seriously big investors should take a company and its prospects, the thing you really need to look at is the vehicle the company is promising. Does it have a seemingly impossible set of tech specs or is it achievable? Have you seen the vehicle in operation or have you heard of someone who has? And is its team of engineers and executives actually having meaningful conversations with members of the press or even the public about what's going on in terms of vehicle development? And by that, I don't actually mean sharing every little thing. I mean, very few companies would do that. I mean, talking about information that's more than what's on the spec sheet. Are they keen to share progress from testing? Do they know their stuff? Can they answer questions on the fly? If the answer is no, then I want to know why not. To all intents and purposes, if the company is engaging in a lot of hyperbole and self-promotion, but when asked, can't or won't show the technology or even have a discussion about it, well, that's a big warning flag. As a side, while I remember, thanks to Gary for reaching out over the weekend with regard to Lordstown. He told me that he has actually seen the endurance up close and personal at a local event in Ohio but he was also able to ask the team with the vehicle some questions. Although some of the answers that were given seem to indicate the truck is still very much in beta, not ready for production. Which flows rather nicely into who attends an event with a new car that's coming to market from a startup. If you're at an event with engineers who are happy and eager to talk about the car and its development and are not hidden somewhere in the back, then it's generally a good sign. When I first met Rivian's team at the LA Auto Show in 2018, that is exactly what I discovered. A team on site that included not just hired in booth babes there to help answer basic questions about the car from members of the public, but also some of the engineering and marketing team. They were able to answer more in-depth questions and based on the questions that I asked and the answers they gave, know their stuff. The same is true of Lucid. When I've met with and talked with Lucid's team, I've not just been given a marketing example. I've been able to ask questions based on what I've been told, and I've had positive feedback that tells me the car is real and engineered well. And frankly, that's very important. When the opposite happens and things are more heavily focused on aesthetics or in-car tech rather than the nuts and bolts underneath, I worry. Based on our experiences with Faraday Future and, to some extent, Byton, that's exactly what they did. Less engineering speak and more superlative emphasis on how the end user could use the car. For most products, that maybe wouldn't be so much of an issue. But a car is a machine and as such, we need to feel that it works and is capable of doing exactly what it's claimed it will do. Which means seeing vehicles in action, either firsthand or through decent videographic evidence. It means seeing the vehicles up close and personal, touching, feeling and experimenting what it is that's coming to market. Which brings me to the final two things that I want to know when interacting with a company about their prospects. How their press team and other members of the team work together to help the media and how their CEO behaves. 
For example, a big tell something's amiss is when I ask the press person a question and either get no response or a closeted response. And no, I'm not talking about Tesla silence because that's Tesla. I'm talking about when a company makes a press release but doesn't have anyone on hand to field extra questions or simply can't or won't go deeper than a verbose, pointless press release. When a company says, at the moment we're not answering that, then follows with something like, but we're going to release that next week or we'll call you, that's great. It's okay when a press person says, I'll get back to you with that answer. And they usually do. It's when they completely ignore you that things go wrong. I'd also like to throw in here that the more comfortable a company is with answering questions and showing you around, the less likely it is that they're hiding something. And the companies that really know their place and are okay with it will say things like, this is a prototype, this is a production intent vehicle, or this part of the vehicle isn't finished yet, but they've still got the media around. There is, of course, the sticky problem of media drives. The closer a company is to production, the more happy they should be letting media behind the wheel. If they're not, well, that's not going to help the impression that their vehicles are ready for production. And plenty of automakers say their cars are ready when they're not, especially ones on today's list. Lucid and Rivian, while light on actual media drives, have let media ride along and see the vehicles, and hopefully they'll do test drives soon. They both have production facilities, and they're both happy to show where they've got to thus far. They've got great investment, and if we go back to my first point, that funding is decent. Neither are going through a reverse merger, because neither need it. And when a company has no problem finding funding, it has the tech and is either already fitting out a production line or has plans to do it in the near future, well, that makes me a lot more comfortable than a company making promises, but failing to answer basic questions. Lastly, we have the person at the helm. That person also plays a major part in how the company will move forwards. Are they a CEO who knows the sector? Are they a business person looking to get a quick buck and screw the consequences? Or are they a natural leader? Someone who knows what they don't know, but is willing to surround themselves with great people who do and can advise appropriately. Without making any obvious call-outs, I think it's clear that the first or last type of CEO is much more likely to have a successful company than the other type. A get-rich CEO and lie to the press is never going to be a good leader. So there you have it. All of the startups I've mentioned today have set themselves bold goals but I think only a few will actually achieve it. And based on this video, I think you know which ones I believe will do that based on what I've seen. That's it. Thanks for joining me and I'll see you next time.